Good afternoon. I'm Tim Musak. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm with Bradford Barthel. AMA analysis and ratings is what I do. Marlene Phillips in our Ontario office also does AMA analysis and ratings. Uh, you can reach us on the uh, Bradford Barthel website. There's a specific link for ratings. If you have ratings you want to send to us, we are happy to take a look at them. Um, ratings at BradfordBarthel.com. Um, about me, I've started working for Bradford Barthel doing exclusively ratings in 2008. Before that, I had pretty extensive workers' comp background beginning in 1988. Uh, I taught my first permanent disability rating class through the Insurance Education Association in April of 1991, and I've taught three different rating schedules, permanent disability rating. So I've been doing it for quite a while. Um, my history in workers' comp is really focused on ratings, trainings, and I've done quite a bit of auditing as well. So today we're going to talk about death claims. Um, we're going to cover three things. We're going to talk about handling a death claim, evaluating a death claim for reserving and calculating attorney's fees, and then commutations, which are usually necessary for paying those attorney fees. So death claims, let's start with that. A death claim comes from an industrial injury that results in the death of a worker. How often are you going to see one? Probably not very often. OSHA, which began in April of 1971, gives us statistics regarding that. Before the inception of OSHA, so in 1970, OSHA reports that 38 workers died in industrial accidents every day. That's nationally. In 2014, that number is reduced to just under 13 a day. And again, that's nationally. Well, how about in California? Uh, 2013, there were 396 deaths total during the year from work-related injuries. 2014, that went down to 334 deaths during the year. So death claims are uncommon, but they are expensive, and they do need to be reported. You need to report it to the state. Um, because of the, the value of a death claim, you probably are going to need some additional reserve authority, so you need to talk to someone in your claim organization. And excess or reinsurance, if that applies to your particular claim, there's requirements for reporting those immediately to excess and reinsurance carriers. So because they are uncommon, I would not expect to memorize everything you need to do about death claims. But when one comes to you, you should check your labor code. Death benefits are discussed in labor code sections 4700 through 4709. There's some additional pieces for public officials uh, labor code sections 4720 to 4727 um, that are relevant only for public officials as employees. Dependents are discussed within labor code sections 3501 to 3503. So when you're handling a death claim, or any claim for that matter, three things everybody wants to know, what's it going to cost, When's it going to close, and can you influence the cost? So for death claims, prompt through investigation, as with any claim, you want to review AOE, COE, make sure it really is industrially related. You want to make sure you have all relevant dependent information. You want to make sure you have accurate wage information for the deceased employee. Look for any subrogation potential. Was anyone else or any other party other than the employer partially responsible for that fatal accident? And apportionment to another carrier. There's no apportionment to non-industrial causes, but it's possible you have a continuous trauma industrial exposure for which there's another carrier that might be involved. So AOE, COE, again, just want to make sure you're really thoroughly looking at what the cause of that injury that caused death was. 
there are some rebuttable presumptions regarding uh, public safety officers and firefighters. So make sure you review those. Again, we're, don't, I would recommend don't try to memorize these things because they're not going to come up frequently for you and you have labor codes available to you. If not at your desk, they're all available online. With respect to public safety officers and firefighters, any presumptions indeed are rebuttable. So take a look at those when you're doing your investigation. Make sure you get a clear understanding of the events that led to that industrial fatality. Subrogation, again, was the accident that caused the death at all attributable to another party. If so, there may be some opportunity for subrogation, and that's one way you might be able to influence the cost of your claim. Apportionment, as, as I stated earlier, not, no apportionment to non-industrial causes, but maybe you've got a continuous trauma exposure and another carrier from whom you can obtain some recovery. So back to death claims, wages and dependents. You, you want to be certain you have an accurate assessment of wages because your benefit payments really do depend on that. They're not the same maximum and minimums as there are for permanent disability for death benefits, so you really want to be accurate. Um, and you want a thorough and accurate search for all dependents, both total dependents and partial dependents. Labor Code Section 4703 talks about the distribution of death benefits to different dependents. Just in general, uh, total dependents share the death benefit equally. So benefits due, based benefits due are calculated based on the date of the injury that caused death, not necessarily the date of death but the date of the injury that caused the death. So the benefits that are due include any temporary total disability or permanent disability benefits that may have accrued prior to the death of the injured worker. So if the injury is not initially fatal and there are other benefits that are due, those are must be paid, those that have accrued by the time of the death. Those can be paid to dependents, heirs, or, or other persons entitled thereto, according to the Labor Code. Other benefits associated with death claims are burial expenses. Um, I'm just going to look at benefits for dates of injury of January 1st, 2006 and thereafter. Um, if you have something older than that, uh, you'll need to check your labor code for what the benefits are associated with that. But burial expenses from January 1st, 2006 are up to $5,000. January For dates of injury, January 1st, 2013 and beyond, that was increased to $10,000. These are up to limits. So theoretically, um, receipts for expenses paid might be an appropriate thing to to obtain. Death benefits are paid to dependents, total and partial dependents, and uh, Labor Code Section 4702 talks about how those are distributed. If there are no dependents, it goes to the DIR. That's Labor Code Section 4706.5. And the amount that goes to the DIR is $250,000. So look for dependents. If that $250,000 is probably better served to a dependent of that injured worker, that fatality, than the DIR. Labor Code Section 4702A6B. I want to mention that because it's a little inconsistency between the Labor Code and current case law. Labor Code Section 4702A6B 
says that um, benefits can be paid to the death benefits can be paid to the estate of the deceased employee. Uh, case law subsequent to that has said no, it can't. If they're not actual dependents, if there's no actual dependents, it goes to the DIR. So note that there's a little inconsistency in the current labor code that has not been reconciled following the court decisions, and I referenced the two court decisions there. I'm not sure. So here's what the death claim benefits are for injuries on or after 1-1-2006. Although burial benefits increased to 10,000 for date of injury 1-1-2013, the death benefits has not. They're, they're the same from 1-1-2006 forward. So one total, no partial dependents, $250,000. Two total dependents, two ninety, three or more. 320, and then um, and then there's if you have partial dependents, you need to figure out the annual amount spent to support any partial dependents. So that initial important aspect of an investigation is finding out the amount spent for supporting those partial dependents. Um, if there are two or more total dependents, then partial dependents are are not going to get anything because 290 is the most for one partial, one total and any partial. There's statute of limitations for death claims, just as there are for any other claim. So be aware of those statute of limitations for your claim. And the dependency, who is a dependent? Well, there's two ways that the WCAB looks at it. There is uh, conclusively presumed dependents are talked about Labor Code Section 3501, so that the minor child, and a minor child is under the age of 18, or any child of any age found to be physically or mentally incapacitated from earning. Of course, has to be dependent on that deceased employee and a spouse earning less than $30,000 in the preceding 12 months is also conclusively presumed. So conclusively presumed, they are dependents. Labor Code Section 3502 says that in all other cases, they're determined by the facts. So the WCAB can make other determinations with respect to dependency. They can uh, find someone is a dependent that isn't conclusively presumed to be a dependent. So that reinforces that you really do want to find out and do a thorough investigation as to who those dependents are. So factual determination of dependency discussed in Labor Code Sections 3502 and 3503. Um, a posthumous child is a dependent. There's special labor code sections for public safety officers and firefighters that that uh, are, are a little different. Uh, payments continue for a dependent child up to age 19 if they're still attending high school. Uh, so make sure you're aware of those. Labor code section 4720 to 4728 and labor code 4708 talks about scholarships for peace officers, correctional officers, firefighters. So some additional labor code sections to be aware of. Again, I'm not recommending you try to memorize any of these, but know there's labor codes that, that apply and find those. Death claims for injuries on or after 1-1-2006. This is the same information I put uh, previously. Uh, burial expenses were increased for dates of injury 1-1-2013. Benef dependency benefits have not changed. They're the same as they were from 1-1-2006, uh, date of injury beyond. So now that we know what the death benefits are, how do we calculate them? 
Labor Code Section 4703.5 says they continue until the youngest child attains, attains the age of 18. Sometimes it's called the minor dependency benefit. So regardless of those amounts that we talked about and 320000 for three or more total dependents, benefits, death benefits continue at least until the youngest child, the youngest dependent child, reaches age 18 in the same manner and amount as temporary total disability would have been paid. So because of that, there's no dollar amount cap. There's up until the youngest reaches 18, and there's no dollar amount cap on that. Um, Labor Code Section 4702.5. I'm sorry, 4702B, um, no payment shall be made at a weekly rate of less than $224 a week. So a minimum wage earner, permanent dis temporary disability rate is lower than that, as is permanent disability rate, but 224 is the minimum benefit for death benefits, the minimum weekly rate. So it's got to be paid every two weeks. And because you're paying it as temporary total disability, it's subject to the two-year rule. The two-year rule, Labor Code Section 4661.5, says that any TTD benefit paid two years or more from the date of injury, the amount of this payment shall be computed in accordance with the current, as of the date the payment is made, TTD average weekly earnings. Average weekly earnings and TTD are discussed in Labor Code Section 4453. And it tells us that TTD benefits minimum and maximum earnings are affected by changes in the state average weekly wage, COLA, effective January 1, 2007. So although COLA does not apply directly to death benefits, COLA applies directly only to permanent total disability and life pension, but indirectly COLA will affect temporary, could affect temporary total disability benefits. And that would be if the deceased worker was either a minimum or a maximum wage earner, COLA might affect the average weekly rate for those benefits. Uh, this sheet, because we have to project COLA, I've done some projections for you. From 2006 through 2016, our minimum average weekly earnings and minimum TTD rates are fixed, uh, as are our maximum average weekly earnings and maximum TTD benefits. Because of that, so are our minimum and maximum death benefits. Minimum is 224, and maximum is the maximum TTD rate. We don't know what COLA is going to be for January 1st, 2017 or 2018 or anything beyond that. So what this sheet does is shows a, a, a projection, and that's all we can do is project. It's unknown at this point, but projected increases, COLA increases of 3%. So projecting 3%, there's where our minimum average weekly earnings, minimum TTD, maximum average weekly earnings, maximum TTD, and then associated minimum and maximum death benefit. That's, that's what those would end up projecting to. Um, we will make this available with the um, continuing education credit certificate. This will be sent to you. So here we go, calculating death benefits. Any accrued and unpaid TTD or PD to the dependents, heirs, or estate, so the estate and heirs are eligible for TTD and PD accrued benefits, not death benefits, but they are, they are eligible to receive TTD and PD benefits that have been accrued and unpaid. Beginning on the date of death, the dependents are due the TTD rate based on average weekly earnings at the time of injury that causes death. 
although not less than 224. There's a caveat there in that the WCAB can order otherwise, and they have at times done that. And uh, specifically, ordering a higher weekly death benefit rate. So the WCAB has that authority and can do that and, and has at times done that. Two years after the date of injury, the benefit rate is subject to the current average weekly earning TTD rate, still not less than 224. So again, that's after the date of injury, not necessarily the date of death. If the injury did not cause a fatality on that same day, we still go back to the date of injury. And that TTD rate is payable as a death benefit until the amount for the, the number of dependents is exhausted, that finite amount that's listed, or it's paid entirely to the dependent minor benefit, whichever is greater. So I'm going to do a couple of examples. I'm going to do three examples, actually. The first two are going to use uh, the same data except for average weekly wages. We're going to use a date of injury of June 1st, 2013. We're going to use a date of death of August 1st, 2013. So that's 61 days after the injury. And we're going to say three total dependents. So the benefit is, the death benefit is $320,000. The youngest dependent date of birth, for this first example, we're going to use 3 2009 so that youngest dependent becomes 18 on 3-2-2027. I use um, timeanddate.com to calculate days and dates in between. Um, whatever you use is great, but uh, it's nice to have some sort of a, an assist for that. So we're calculating death benefits, for example, number one, we're using that date of injury, date of death, date of birth of the youngest dependent. We're using average weekly earnings of 390 for the, the worker that was fatally injured, and that TD rate based on the 390 is 260. So the benefits that are due in this particular case, we've got average weekly earnings of 390, TTD rate of 260. TTD accrued prior to the death, 61 days at 260. Death benefits, the minimum was 224. This particular TTD rate for this particular individual is greater than that, so we pay it the 260. So the rest of the year of 2013, it's paid at 260 a week. Death benefits don't actually start until August 1st. Two years after the date of injury, not the date of death, after the date of injury, June 1, 2015, two years, the two-year rule we got to look at. We're looking at the minimum average weekly earnings and TTD rate, the TTD rate of 165.49. So there's no increase. This particular injured worker is still above that amount. Every January 1st now, after that initial two years, you have to look for updated minimum average weekly earnings TTD. So again, we projected 3% annual cre increases thereafter. Youngest turns 18 on March 2nd, 2027. $320,000 has not been paid yet, so you keep going. Still looking at the 3% COLA increases. Based on the uh, projections of 3% increases to the minimum average weekly earnings, TTD rates, the benefit rate for this case will increase based on these COLA projections January 1, 2031, when the minimum TTD rate is projected to be $263.72, which is greater than the 260 that the TTD rate this particular injured worker's wages would uh, include. So we're going to look at, I'm going to skip to this. This is a projection. This shows the projections on that. And on this one, 2013 is the date of injury. We pay TTD benefits. We're just, I'm just running a 
tracking the running total of death benefits on the far right column, and I don't include TTD in that. We just we want to track the death benefit, even though it's the same rate. It's the death benefit. So we're showing what the minimum TTD rate does not affect this particular death benefit claim until 2031 when the rate increases to 263.72. That's we're projecting. That's the new minimum. So each year after that, a, another three percent increase. Um, eventually, the $320,000 is paid approximately September 2nd, 2036, and this shows how that would increase, how the average weekly earnings, the minimum average weekly earnings, and therefore minimum TTD rate would change. Example number two, we're going to use the same date of injury, date of death, same age, date of birth of the youngest dependent, but we're going to look at a significantly higher average weekly earnings on the date of injury. So this injured worker, we're going to say, was making $2,100 a week. The TTD rate maximum at that time is $1,066.72. So during 2013, that's the maximum TTD rate. So this person was a max earner, but we need to know more than just a max earner. We need to know the actual average weekly earnings. So we pay the TTD benefits up through date of death. Death benefits begin August 1st on the date of death, and at the same TTD rate. Two years after the date of injury, so June 1st, the average weekly earnings, this person, the, the death benefits are subject to current uh, TTD rates, and they have changed. So we need to increase the death benefit rate on June 1st, 2015 to $1,103.29 because that's the minimum rate as of that time. And then every January 1st thereafter, we need to take a look at that. So the death benefit rate changes June 1st of 2015, then January 1st, 2016, and thereafter. The youngest child does not turn 18 until March 1st, March 2nd, 2027. So just go to this uh, particular slide ahead of time here and show how that the benefit projection goes. So Jan June 1st, 2015, death benefit rate increases based on current maximum. And it increases again January 1st, 2016, 2017, all the way through, up through 2022, 2023, and then 2024, although the maximum TTD rate would increase to $1,429.44, this particular injured worker's wages of $2,100 create a maximum of $1,400. So we don't go beyond that. It's still based on wages at time of injury. So although that two-year rule says we increased based on minimums, this person, the, the, the dependents, based on the deceased employee's earnings of $2,100, is never entitled to more than $1,400 for a, the weekly rate. So in this one, the, uh, the benefits would continue beyond the $320 far beyond the $320,000, paying up through 3-1-2027 because the youngest dependent turned 18 on March 2nd. So in this particular case, $890,000 plus is the death benefit to the three dependents. Before I move on, I just want to talk about for total dependents, total dependents receive an equal share of the death benefit. In this particular case, we talked about three or more, so there's at least one older sibling. Uh, once that older sibling turns 18, that older sibling does not get part of that death benefit, so now it's divided by two, the spouse and this youngest um, sibling. Okay, so I'm going to do one more example. We're going to use the this 
same date of injury, same date of death, but I'm going to use the youngest dependent date of birth, uh, 2002. So the youngest dependent turns 18 in 2020. Average weekly earning 1,200, TTD rate of 800. Um, you can reference back to this and show you what the calculations are. But I, this shows us what we what we look at through the course of paying that death benefit. TTD is paid for the uh, TTD period prior to the death. Um, death benefit then then starts on August 1st. Um, June 1st, 2015, two years from the date of injury, we look for the two years. Um, the minimum TTD increases, but this person's rate does not go up. COLA does not apply directly. Um, the youngest uh, minor child turns 18 on March 2nd, 2020. 320 has 1,000 has not been paid yet, so you keep paying till the 320. So you pay till the youngest turns 18 or 320, whichever turns out to provide a greater benefit. And approximately April 1, 2021, the $320,000 has been paid. So I went through these three examples to show that uh, the COLA does not apply directly to death benefits. COLA applies to changes in minimum and maximum average weekly earnings and the results in temporary total disability rates, and that applies to death benefits, but it does not apply directly to death benefits. Commutations, we'll look at those. Um, after calculating the death benefit, as we just did, um, there's quite often attorney fees to pay based on that. Um, and part of that calculation process is to in, including um, any potential increases in death benefits. Make sure you get an accurate assessment of what that death benefit is because that applicant attorney wants an accurate assessment of what fees they're going to get. Um, and it's uh, quite often 15%. Um, I don't think that's set in stone, but quite often it's 15%. And the commutation is how we work through that. So commutations. Um, the DIR's website has lots of information about the commutations. It's not always easy to, to look at, but we're going we're gonna to try and look through some of these things. Uh, California Code Regulation 10169 talks about commutation tables and in instructions, and all of these rules and regs are online as well. But um, present value of life pension at 3%, 3%, 3%. Um, I didn't really talk about it, but for COLA projections, I did 3%. Um, although there was... Um, question regarding what the projection should be in the past, it's pretty well set now that 3% is an appropriate projection for COLA increases. It's appropriate projection for increases in permanent total disability and life pension increases. That's a little off the topic, but also that's uh, an appropriate projection for death benefit increases, as we just did. 3% is an appropriate projection. There's no need to project a higher amount. Um, for your reserves or for payments or for calculating attorney fees or any reason. And, and the reason we're looking at this, the 3% interest, is that's, that came to be a, a watermark for it, determining that 3% is an appropriate amount. I'm going to see if I can. Now, and talk a little bit more. DEU, I've, I'm given website uh, or links here to the different uh, places you can get that information uh, regarding commutation of death benefits. And I'm going to see if I can, uh, without making too much of a mess, uh, find those. Yeah, I did without making too much of a mess. Um, so this is the uh, DIR 
www.ca.gov um, DWC, so slide number 39, uh, if you uh, go to that link, that will get you to this page. And if we scroll down a little bit, we get to DEU forms. And within that, we see commutation templates and instructions is a zip file. We see commutation requests. We'll talk about that a little later. But you can send your request in to the DEU. And then it talks about the rules and regulations where the tables can be found. It's right here. If you click into that, you're going to come to right here to this particular page. And it gives you commutes regulation 10169, gives you commutations. There's three tables. And um, you may or may not be able to see the read these as I did them. But um, you've got three tables. Table 1 as present value of permanent disability 1%. Table 2, present value of life pension for a male. Table 3, present value of life pension for a female. Table 1 is, does not have a male and female differentiation. There's one table. It is, however, five pages long, and this is what it looks like. So if you click into that Table 1 on the DEU's website, this is what you're going to see. You're going to get five pages worth of present value of permanent disability at 3%. There's number of weeks in the left-hand column, followed by PV, and that goes over. So there's several columns per page. But that's how that's structured. Table 2 is looks like this. This is only page 1. And that's table 3. That's only page 1. Um, page 2, it goes up to, um, it only goes to um, age 95 which should be plenty, but it only cover for life pension. There's a little bit of an issue because it will only give you present values for up to 88% permanent disability. So we have permanent disability above 88%. You're trying to calculate life pension. That you can't find it on these tables. So I'm going to go back to the table one. That's what we're going to use for doing commutations of death benefits. If you go into the commutations, um, the zip file that I showed you on the DEU's website, and you bring up an Excel sheet, an Excel book that will have commutation templates in them. And it'll be like that. Example A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So there's seven different templates in there. Um, the DEU website also refers you to life expectancy tables that are needed for lifetime benefit projections for permanent total disability and life pension. Ordinarily, you don't need that for death benefits. The exception would be if you have a minor child that is going to be physically or mentally incapacitated from earning. You'll need to project that minor child's life expectancy. But otherwise, you don't need those life expectancy tables. While I'm talking about the life expectancy tables, again, a little bit off topic, but I just want to point out, I just noticed recently um, that the uh, self Office of Self-Insurance Plans has issued new life expectancy tables for 2011. And the official word from them is that if you're calculating reserves for 2015, you use the 2010 tables. If you're calculating reserves for 2016, you're going to use the 2011 tables. Um, so keep that in mind as you're doing reserves this year. Life expectancy tables, 2011. And that's the link to get to it on the DEU's website. So commutations. Here's the seven different commutations. Um, we're going to look at A, B, and C, commutation of all remaining PD. It's not PD, it's death benefits, but it's the same concept in that there's a fixed end to the benefits. Commutation of PD off the far end, same thing. Not, we're not doing PD, we're doing death benefits. 
commutation of PD by uniform reduction. These others, and these A, B, and C all use present value table one. So we're only going to use present value table number one for these three. D, E, F, G all use present value tables two or three. But we're just going to do one, or A, B, and C, present value table one for death benefits, and that's really all you need for death benefits. Um, for the um, examples I've given you, um, using the date of commutation, I put today's date. If you're doing a, computa a commutation, you, you really don't want to use the date you're doing it. You want to do a date where it's reasonable that you're going to get that benefit payment that you're calculating out. So um, if I do a calculation of commutation today and use today's date, that that means I got to get that payment out today. Um, so um, use the date the DWC recommends if you're sending something to them, make it at least two to three weeks in advance uh, rather than the date you're actually doing the commutation because that should reflect the date you're going to be able to get a check out. So we're going to use uh, death benefit calculation example number three. So that was example number three. It was $1,200 was the average weekly earnings. Death benefit per rate was 800. We paid a total of $320,000, and um, at 800 a week, it was 400 weeks. We didn't have any increases to the death benefit rate for this one. So a total of 320. So we're going to assume attorney fees of uh, $48,000. 15% of that 320 gives us. $48,000. And is this the one? This is the one. So slide number 50, 50 of what you're looking at right now um, is what we're at. So it's showing date of commutation of today. It's from the death benefit. Again, we're not doing PD. We're doing death benefit. It started, the death benefit started August 1st, 2013. We divided the 320 by the 800 and figured it was 400 weeks. So that's, that's where I got that, just divided 320 by the 800, paying an even 400 weeks, gives us $320,000. So this, then this is what's going to calculate for you. The, the uh, sheet will calculate that 128 weeks have gone between these two dates, PD start and data commutation. And it tells you there's 272 weeks left to pay. And, and uh, it gives you that 272. This is where you need to, to look at your present value table number one. And what it says to do, it actually is filled in these. And um, so you take from present value table one, 273 will give us this in the corresponding present value. 272 gives us this corresponding value. And it'll do the rest for you. It comes up with the, I'm sorry, the commuted value of all death benefit is 201,549.76. So that is uh, if we're paying all remaining death benefits. And on January 13th, 2016, 128 weeks have been paid. Um, you, uh, 201,549.76 goes out now. From that 201,000, 48,000 is attorney fees. What that ends up, it doesn't show you anywhere on the form, but it ends up giving you $16,050.24. Um, interest savings. We're going to use the same data, the $800 a week, uh, for, and we're going to look at number at example B, commutation off the far end for death benefits. So I'm going to go to. I'm going to go to slide number 52, same data, 
The death benefit starts August 1st, commutation 113, 2016, 400 weeks, 800 a week, $48,000 for attorney fees commuting, um, and we're going to take it off the far end. Um, we get the same, the same data here, uh, 272 weeks left, so that the form fills these in, and then you need to go to present value table number one for these two. And what that does is that tells us um, $48,000, sorry, making this go up and down here. $48,000 is the amount to be commuted, and ultimately it tells us that, there's a second page to it, and that's why it's doing that for me, $162,620 is still due at the con after that commutation, after that payment of $48,000 to African attorney goes out, and that takes away 68.7238 weeks off the far end. So that means you're paying for a shorter period of time. So benefits will end, death benefits will end approximately December 6, 2019. We'll look at one more example. By uniform reduction, this, this, this has become the more common method of commutation. Uniform reduction of the future meth payment. Um, more common for uh, a benefit that the WCAB feels is in the uh, recipient's best interest to continue receiving for as long as possible. Um, so we're going to do the same thing, $48,000, all the same all the same stuff. And what this uh, C, commutation of PD by uniform reduction of benefits, these all end up being the same. These PV amounts are the same. It's the same number of weeks we're dealing with. Uh, but what it does down here is it gives us this, Section 4 of that commutation. And Section 4 shows a reg the weekly rate is $800, but the reduction because of the commutation is $190.52. So what that tells us is we 128 weeks were due as of the date of commutation, so that's going to be paid. 48000 is the amount we're commuting, so a check goes to African attorney for that amount. And then all benefits effective 1-14-2016 and thereafter, we reduce by $190.52. So rather than $800 a week death benefit, 60948 goes. Commutations. There's limitations to um, these commutation forms. The initial commutation worksheets were issued in 2001. Um, table one, the present value for commutation of current benefits, ends at 19 or 950 weeks, so 18.27 years. That's as far out as you can calculate with that. Um, COLA is not included. You can request commutation. We can request commutations from the DEU, and there's this particular link will get you to requesting commutations from the DEU, and this is what the commutation request looks like. One thing I wanted to point out on this is COLA. There's a, there's a spot for SAWW, and it says to leave it blank, DEU will use 3% unless the judge offers something different. Um, so 3% is, is, has become the standard projection for COLA going into the future. Okay, I'm going to, so what we've talked about, death claims, calculating benefits, they are uncommon, they are expensive, and the benefit amount can really vary greatly. Um, I would expect that you'd want to check your labor code and obtain assistance as needed. Mm -hmm. 
I have one more example I want to look at. And I'm going to want to look at a um, death benefit commutation where the rate increased and increased significantly. So the one we looked at um, was um, a $2,100 a week average weekly earning. This one is not in the PowerPoint, but I'm, I'm adding this one in here. Um, and I'm going to do a projection uniform reduction of payments for the death benefit. And this is what it's going to look like. As you can see, um, the amount to commute it's all X's up here. And the reason it's all X's, there's just not room in there. These D DU forms are locked. You can't edit them. So I, I wasn't able to stretch this out and be able to put it in there. But this particular example, we, we, we looked at the youngest turning 18 on March 2nd, 2027. So benefits were paid from August 1st, 2013 through March 1st, 2027, a total of $890,383.25. And as you recall, the benefits increased for a while, um, and then they did not. Once it reached $1,400 a week, it did not increase. So if we look at attorney fees, if we say it's 15%, uh, that's $133,557.49 is what we're going to look at. And it turns out, um, the time we paid from August 1st, 2013 to 3-1-2027 was 708 weeks, four days. So that's where I came up with that. I just did the division or, or did the date and time calculator from, from the day we begin benefits to the day we project they would end and came up with 708.7143 weeks. So this does this calculation. It tells us in Section 2A, 2B, that fills in the 580, 579 from that first calculation in section one. And we know need to go to present value table number one to get these corresponding values. 580 weeks from table number one, present value correlation is 494.0662 and so on. And what this does again shows us here's the amount being commuted. That's the check that's got to go out uh, today. And I take that back. I did data commutation of 120 on this one. So it goes out next Monday or next Wednesday. Um, and here's our reduction. Our reduction is going to be $270.44. Um, you might notice that I put 1,066.72 as a weekly rate, um, although that rate it varies. What happens is um, the, the important part of this uniform reduction is seeing the $270.44, line 4B. That's the subtraction from uh, the weekly benefit. So if we go back to slide number 33, and I'm going to see if I can get back there. I have to do it. I think I do. Oh, got it. Let me see if I can get back to 33 here real quick like. 33, there's our av these are our death benefit rates. Whatever that rate is, we subtract that reduced amount, $270.44. Okay? So that's how we go through that. Um, OK. Uh, so again, I'm just going to wrap up from here. We have questions that I'm going to take. So what we did today is we talked about death benefits. We talked about evaluating death benefits. And we talked about commutation of death benefit claims. So I'm going to see if I can answer some questions that have been sent in. And let's see where we go with that. If there's an unborn child at the time of death, would that be considered a total dependent? Yes, it would for the max death rate. Yes, it would. That's a total dependent. So if there's already a child that is born and a spouse, that becomes a third dependent. 
If you had an accepted claim, wouldn't all TDPD benefits be paid on going at time of death? Yes. Uh, hopefully they are. An example of when it might not be, maybe you didn't accept that it was industrial related. Maybe you didn't accept that death was caused by the industrial injury. Um, and it took a trial to determine, for a WCAB judge to determine that indeed that was an industrial injury and death benefits are due because of that. Are there any commutation calculators for just life pension and PD? Um, yes, the those uh, life pension calculators, the the fourth series, can give you that information. So you can commute from either the permanent disability or you can commute from the life pension. In fact, I've seen where um, there has been attorney fees commuted from each. So yes, those last four commutations. So what is that? D E F G will deal with those. What was the life expectancy reference, or where is the starting point for finding? You know what? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to scroll to that, but if you, it's it's the Office of Self Insurance Plan. So I think if you put in OSIP life expectancy, I think you'll find it. Do you need DNA to show proof? Not that I know of. Although there may be situations where where there's uh, an argument um, as to whether someone is a dependent and therefore entitled to a share of that benefit. So uh, uh, potentially, but ordinarily I would say no. If the youngest dependent dies prior to age 18, do benefits stop or paid to the spouse? Uh, they are paid to the spouse until the 320 is paid or unless there's another dependent that's not yet 18. But so the, the, and the 320 is again assuming three total dependents. So whatever the death benefit is in that particular case. If a child has special needs and is totally disabled, does the death benefit pay only until that child is 18? No, if they're physically or mentally incapacitated from earning, I think that's close to the way the labor code reads then they're you pay for the lifetime of that particular dependent. So uh, death benefits can range from 250000 into the millions, theoretically, based on that scenario. Um, and and it's, it, it happens. So um, yes, it can, it can really be expensive. If a girlfriend is found to be a full dependent and she marries, does that end her benefits? No. If she's, it's based on the dependency at the time. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just think I just understood the question. If she subsequently marries, no, not in California. Um, in other jurisdictions, it does, but that's more if it's a lifetime benefit. But in California, no. There's nothing in the labor code that says it ends if uh, a spouse marries. Could I discuss suicide and death benefits? Not really intelligently. It's mentioned on that on one of the slides. Um, every case was different. It, it, there's the potentiality that the WCAB can rule a suicide was in fact an industrial related injury, despite the labor code saying suicide is is not a compensable act. There's an issue as to causation, and an exhumation is necessary. The family refused. How does that affect? I don't know. I would expect that we, you'd want to get that addressed before uh, the burial. Um, I, I don't know how that would affect that. Domestic partner was proof. Can they collect? Um, it says spouse. I think in California now that. Uh, a, you, there's marriages. Um, I believe that uh, I believe they can collect. And someone responds that they believe that WCAB has the authority to exhume. So there's an answer to a prior question. Thank you for that uh, answer. And that looks to be about all the questions that uh, we have right now.
Okay. So thank you all very much.